Okay, on the show today, Stephen Jenkinson. So introduce him to sort of a little bit of a story in a way that um, I think death has been an acquaintance of mine since I was relatively young through a number of suicides, really. And so the, the idea of a choice of death being present and then later in kind of working in war zones. But with the Ukraine work last year, I thought, you know what, I need to up my understanding of this topic, you know, and some Buddhist death meditations and things like that. So I started asking around like, hey, you know, there's shadows in our household and we kind of need to need to understand a bit more. And uh, his, Stephen's name was the name that most came up when I was asking about who's a, a death expert, slightly ridiculous term, perhaps. And um, I thought, OK, so I started looking into him. My friend Tad Hargrave, his opinion, I respect really um talked about him and it's his orphan wisdom school which i immediately thought was a great name uh so i looked into it and, and you know this guy's helped over a thousand well over a thousand people die working in palliative care written a number of books on this topic like you know serious number actually and his work extends well beyond death work he was the the subject of a film called um uh death walker um which i think grief, was grief right. walker actually. grief walker excuse me grief walker it's all right and you know his work extends into culture gender all kinds of interesting areas so um stephen you are super welcome cheers you got me on a, a coffee break and i got the the um merchandise out there in case anybody has any questions about my orientation got it Normally, I, I start by asking people about, you know, their life, but I know it's kind of boring. So let's, let's start on the other end. Um, how do you want to die, Stephen? Well, that presumes that I want to. So I, I wouldn't go along with that necessarily. Um, you, you might think that the death guy, you know, nominally understood, must be keen on the subject. Well, I might be keen on the subject, but I'm not necessarily keen on the advent for me personally. So, uh, but but when it comes and it's hopefully it's hopefully it's indisputable. Uh, hopefully, there's a clarity about the matter and the timing of it. It's not uh, you know up for discussion. And uh, even the people who've been around it for a good while, such as myself, I don't know that any of us necessarily have the market cornered on readiness. So that's probably overstated. I think the the matter would be one of recognition not preparedness it's not a crisis after all it's not a calamity uh, it's a it's an oncoming thing that's already there in everything except time and place oh and nature i suppose as well but the facts are already available right so there's nothing to wait for and another way of saying that is my death if i may say not unlike your own is not actually in the future the fact of our deaths is in the present. This is where we get to encounter it. This is why we don't have to wait for anything. This is why a terminal diagnosis is a bit, if you've done your work, it's a bit redundant. I mean, it's, it's necessary, but it should be an affirmation of something that shouldn't come as a shock. So the notion of sudden death, for example, is a kind of... Um, the clarity about sudden death is that there's no such thing. If you've engaged the matter at hand, you know, when you were able and capable and cognizant and upright and so forth, then the this the oncomingness of the of the dying is an affirmation of your your inclination to give it time and to give it a place. Sudden death is an indication that you've um, that you've been truant on the matter. And then you've been caught unawares, which really for a grown up, there's not a lot of, this is going to sound very severe, but there's not a lot of excuse for sudden death. Mm -hmm. I've listened to quite a few interviews that you've done, and quite often you're almost challenging the frame of the interviewer around death. They'll ask you a question and you'll say, I don't think it's, this is another way to see it. And at first, I just thought you were cantankerous. I thought, you know, he just likes arguing with people or something. But then I went, oh, this guy's got a whole nother way of looking at this topic. Right. What are some of the main kind of misunderstandings of the very frame around death that people generally have in the West? 
Uh, well, in no particular order, as they just as it occurs to me, one is um, dying is what happens to you. It kind of drops in out of the clear blue and intrudes desperately upon your otherwise orderly existence. There's a big one. In that sense, death is not really naturally occurring, no matter what kind of lip service we pay. If we really come to it as an intrusion into the natural order of things, we haven't given it five minutes worth of legitimacy. And that's a, that's a derelict duty, really. Uh, another one, which is more, probably more contemporary, is that uh, your death belongs to you. In that sense, it's a personal possession to dispose of or to underserve as you see fit. It's a kind of lifestyle option that's extended to you. It's a kind of right that you have. Um, none of these things, I mean, these things are demonstrably wrong. But uh, you, you asked me for a, a bit of a list. Uh, I could add a couple more and say, um, oftentimes it's understood to be principally a metabolic event with certain unfortunate but irreversible sort of human attributes sort of Velcroed onto the side of the metabolics. And uh, in actual fact, it's a, it's a whole person event with some metabolics Velcroed on the side. It's the, the virtual reverse of what the medicalization of the event suggests. Uh, another one that comes a little closer to home for people who are working in the trade is that everybody knows how to do the care of dying people here in the mouth, by the tongue, with the language. And then, then people have, you know, um, superly achieved capacity with respect to surgery and anesthetics and things of this kind. In actual fact, I can tell you, being a, uh, I was an adjunct professor at the medical school, <clears throat> there actually was no course, there was no training of, at the time, of any kind for people in the trade to em employ or engage their language. Zero. Just, just to interrupt, for the trade, you mean sort of death doulas or people in palliative care, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Physicians, uh, you know, all the ancillary people that are involved. Yeah, that's right. There was no training in how to speak dying as if it were a, a given, as if everybody already knew how to do it. And I can promise you, none of that was true. So this was a, a tremendous and gaping wound in the preparedness of of people paid to know better, to be able to engage the realities of dying to the point where, and I'll finish with this, you could say that the language that was resorted to by the paid professionals had the effect of banishing the realities of dying while allegedly approaching them. So think, for example, about probably in your corner of the world, this is somewhat true, how many euphemisms uh, are employed at the expense of the word die or dying oh, or oh, death? No, the, the, the oh. past or the, the whatever. It's like fucking say dead. Okay, so, so ask yourself whether or not any of these seem to serve the reality of dying by banishing the word, the industrial strength sort of D sounding, Germanic sounding thing in favor of a kind of a word with no consonants, you know, and just vowels, a word that's oohs and ahs and reassures. And, and man, when the, when the reality comes through the door, I promise you this, you'll be doing no bloody transitioning. I promise you that. It's work. It's not feelings. It's work. And maybe that's the last one, eh? The, the notion that dying is what happens to you. In fact, dying is what you do or fail to do, or refuse to do, or are not alert to the fact that it's what you do. And, uh, and nobody deserves, nobody should be in line for a dying that's principally passive, that that uh, besets you and bewilders you and uh, bedevils you. Mm -hmm. But that's what I saw most of the time. See, I've, I've heard you say this before, that most of the time people were beset, bedeviled, 
struggling madly in terror. It's not maybe this this term you'll you'll push back on. Feel free. It's it's not a good death. No, it's indeed it's not a good death. Sorry, did you have more to to ask there? How do you have a good death? Well, I mean, before you imagine the mechanics, you have to imagine the signposts, what your understanding of what, so of what constitutes dying. Failure to do that will deliver you to the to a, a, a great misfortune. So alertness to what you bring to the fray is the first order of awareness that you have to manage and maintain. So uh, a lot of the prejudices I was just mentioning a few minutes ago, I mean, I didn't make any of those up. I observed them all. So they're they're in full play all across the span of what constitutes Western culture. Of, of this, I have no doubt. And every place where the internet touches, this death phobia and all its iterations touches at the same time, the same kind of first contact with um, uh, globalization is the first contact with death phobia. No doubt in my mind that it's, it's proliferating and that's one of the mechanisms by which it does so. So a good death, in and of itself as an idea is not revolutionary. It doesn't help anything. What you have to do first is imagine what you bring to the fray called the kind of grudge match that you might have with the enterprise. And you realize that all your understandings of good would come from those prejudices. They wouldn't come from dying, number one. Number two, a good death is available to you basically as a consequence of your exposure to the myriad number of deaths that precede your own that are available to you in the course of a normally lived, vaguely communal life. In other words, the, the, the degree to which you obey the kind of force field of privacy around dying is the degree to which your personal poverty will proliferate when your own dying comes around. There's really no way to gain a depth of field on the matter without the real thing intruding into your otherwise ill-considered plans for the thing. If you don't, if you're not in on endings and frailties and limits, if you're not in on the dyings of animals and friends and relatives and strangers, that all that have preceded your own, you've kind of been terribly truant. And uh, you may have respected people's privacy, but to no one's benefit that you've done so. Hmm. My sense listening to you is that this death phobia, as you put it, is not just about you know, ruining death, but also ruining life. The, that it's not not just the, the event of death. It's this runs the impact of these beliefs or misunderstandings impact all aspects of life, whether it be initiation, childhood, marriage, work. Like they're all impacted by this, right? This isn't just like, oh yeah, this is going to screw up your last year in hospital bed. No, no. First of all, um, you know, people where you live, like people where I live, are living longer every decade. Okay. So that's the first order of business. Second order of business is, where do you think that lengthening life attaches itself to in your lifespan? Do you think by living, by virtue of living longer, you're an infant longer? You're an adolescent longer? Yep. You're middle-aged longer? No, you're older longer. Yeah, I saw a doctor, I said, look, you guys have done really well. You've added a year of suffering to human beings. Okay. It's like that's that's mostly the impact, right? Is, is you're in that half period for longer it is it is and this is not necessarily a bad thing but it's a uh, it's very it's vital that we seize upon the understanding that we'll be older longer more afflicted longer more infirm longer no matter what they're promising you at amazon and the like that's the truth of the matter which is to say this that the 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 advent or the news of your dying will be more available to you 
in a more uh, adamant fashion for longer than most of your uh, ancestors were ever obliged to live it. Okay? That being the case, you will die longer than anyone in your uh, family, in your prior family, has done so. <clears throat> How do I? That's a bit of a leap. So let me just articulate the leap of, uh, for a second. In the death trade, when I was there, people spoke the following uh, ideal. I'd like to have a long and healthy life and then die really quickly. That's basically the scheme for, you know, max contentment. So here's the dilemma. When do you begin to die such that the timer says you're dying quickly? Is it the onset of symptoms? Is it, is it the onset of heavy breathing? Is it the onset of compromised circulatory system? What, what, what magic moment are you imagining there by which you can... Uh, start to configure your time frame for a quick death. And I can tell you that in the West, generally speaking, death begins in a way that has nothing to do with symptoms. Death begins when your suspicions begin to mount that you're not sick, that this is not another iteration of the flu or the cold or you know whatever else has beset you during the course of your life that this is categorically different, this is irreversible. It's contestable, but it's not reversible. When that sets in, you have begun to die. And it doesn't really matter if you agree or not. You've been beset by the, the, the solidity of the, the, excuse me, the suspicion. And as a result of that, you will not get your wish to die quickly, you see. Because what we're really wishing for in the West is to live long and to die not knowing we're dying. It's awareness that detonates the beginning of the ticker, you see. And so the, the arrangement, sadly but truly, is to circumvent your awareness in order to circumvent the beginning of your dying. Nothing very embodied about that. Mm. Is, is denial of aging part of this as well like um i have some very good elders i spoke to my mentors quite elderly last night I, you know had a long apprenticeship with an embodiment and you know i have good role models for aging but i'm i'm also aware of you know just being in middle age i'm aware of the grief of a few things getting a bit creakier my eyes don't work so well i had to get a pair of glasses for the first time in my life this week and um is that part of it as well? Like just denying aging as a thing? I see that particularly coming from stateside. It's in there. But um, I think this has to do with uh, that which aging is a subset of, which is a compromise of this ideal called your potential. Mm -hmm. That's really what it comes down to. If you... If you buy hook, line, and sinker, the cultural norm that you're obligated to be all you can be and that this constitutes maximum happiness and fulfillment, then you realize, hopefully, that this is true for a very narrow window of your life that you can fire on all cylinders, right? The rest of the time, you're either learning how to do that or you're learning how to not do that anymore. That's the lion's share of your allotment is spent doing so, is coming down off the, you know, the mountaintop of maximum capacity. That's most of your life is spent getting there or the denouement thereafter. So aging is not in and of itself the exhaustion of that understanding. Aging is a, is a subset of limits and endings and frailties. And all mm. of those are available to you without the benefit necessarily of chronological age. If you are, for example, beset by a certain kind of infirmity that is not deemed to be age appropriate, that's not part of a youth experience, for example, then you have, you have a kind of accelerated encounter with these things prior to when your chronology would deliver you there. There's an enormous benefit to this, but it will not be experienced, of course, as a benefit for the for the short and medium term. 
But the, the sooner we give up the notion that young people, by definition, deserve an undisturbed uh, biological and physical life, the sooner aging will not be deemed to be a catastrophe, uh, you know, awaiting us. Mm. The sacredness of potential is certainly very deep in the culture of the West. Um, I notice you're fairly critical of Western culture. What do you what do you love about Western culture? <laughs> um, yeah, I was about to say, uh, you know, you don't see me going to live somewhere else. <laughs> right, you're not in Saudi Arabia. So, right? um, mm. No, indeed. No. So, you know, I know myself to be a child of fortune that I was born, for example, in Canada. And uh, and I'm I remain um, lucky and privileged, but not content on the matter. So the contentiousness comes from the fact that given our privileges, given our status, given our our standing, you know, uh, uh, intellectually, not so much, but uh, uh, instrumentally or, or technologically, given all of that, we frankly should be doing a better job of taking care of that which was entrusted to us than we are. Full stop. You can't qualify that. You can't say except and da, da, no, no. That comes with the territory. If you're lucky enough to be born in a place where you're not worrying about your food, for example, if you're born to a place where you're not waiting for a, a, a pack of brown shirts to burst through the back door because you're sitting talking with people in your house, then you ought to proceed like the responsibilities of citizenship thrust you forward. You don't really have a choice on that matter. I don't believe. And so, sadly, I find that the self-absorption of Western cultures in particular uh, mitigates against us engaging the conditions of citizenship ongoingly in a time of trouble in particular. And we are in a time of trouble regardless of our privileges. And, uh, and sadly, we employ the privileges to opt out of the, the culture work that a time like this is really uh, beckoning us towards. That's my principal dilemma. What do I love about uh, being here? Uh, probably what I said to you a minute ago, you know, I ran a school before the pandemic and we're trying to reconstitute it now. And uh, one of the things that struck me at the time when it was suddenly gone was how, how iffy our remarkable run has been. Right. It's very, the standing is, yeah. And uh, Leonard Cohen, I think, said it best years ago when he was reflecting upon the, the coming down of the Berlin Wall and other things. And he wrote down in one of his poetry books, and another thing he said, you're not going to like what comes after America. So there's that. And I'm more yeah. than aware that, uh, that the American experiment flawed and frustrating and fatal as it would appear to be is um, not by any stretch the worst that humanity has been capable of generating. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't swap it for Chinese techno authoritarianism. And it's a hell of an opportunity. That's what kind of I hear you kind of say that it's a hell of an opportunity, even if that opportunity is normally wasted, just not being hungry. You know, I've spent time in East Africa, you know, not being in a war all the time. It's a hell of an opportunity. Yeah. That can frustrate me. Um, do you think we're in a time of decadence? This is a kind of word I've been exploring lately. You know, the sort of what comes after America or what comes after the West more broadly. Like, is your sense that we're in a time of decline? I've heard this talked about in different ways. Like, hey, you know, we sent a person to the moon. What the hell's happened since then? Or you know, even just like economically, like young people seem to have a worse deal than the generation before, you know, maybe the first generation are poorer than their parents in the West. And then culturally, there's some feeling of, you know, Barbie and Oppenheimer are at the cinema just over there. And I'm not sure which is worse. You know, I'm not sure kind of which form of destruction I'd rather face. Like, what's your sense of decadence in the culture? Well, if decadence and decay are etymologically uh, aligned and related, which I suspect they are. 
then I think the word decay may not principally describe a moral order in decline. I'm inclined to understand what's going on now <clears throat> as something much more necessary than it is misfortune. Mm -hmm. That there's a degree of correction that we didn't seem to be willing to undertake voluntarily. And so W.H. Auden you know, said this one as well as anyone has. He said, it seems to me we'd rather be defeated than be persuaded. Mm -hmm. The persuasion is more than available, but the persuasion requires you not to get to the breaking point first because afterwards is not a decision. It's a collapse. Mm -hmm. You decide minus the catastrophe. That's what's available to us or was. I'm not in, I'm not really persuaded that 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 choice remains available in the way that it might have been 15 or 25 years ago. I have no way of knowing these things. This intuitively speaking, uh, I look out on a burnt and blistered landscape uh, psychologically mostly, and I'm I'm brought to mind the following. So I was in Athens recently, first time I've worked in Greece. They had a screening of uh, Grief Walker there. Nobody went home. Everybody wanted to stay for the length of the Q&A in a sweat box of a theater. And when the Q&A was over, uh, nobody would leave yet. So I tried to leave and people formed a kind of bubble wrap group around me and just sort of followed me around. And yeah. in that group was a young woman. I'm gonna say she's maybe 20. And she had these burning coal eyes, you know, and she wanted to say something and she wanted to make sure I heard her say it. So I acknowledged her and this is more, you know, to paraphrase her, this is what she said. I'm not afraid to die. I'm afraid to live. I don't know if that's decline or recognition or timeliness or the collapse of choice or some version of all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The self-hatred in young people is what I see. And activist friend, Rosie, a bit younger than me, she adores you. So I phoned her up ahead of the call and said, hey, I'm talking to this guy, give me some, you know, give me some input. You know this guy's work better than me. Uh, shout out to Rosie. She's awesome. And um, she seemed to be expressing like a frustration of this. It's there. You can look into the lack of initiation. You can look into how we treat the environment you can look into the lack of wisdom around death it's there it's right there if you want to and she was expressing a frustration of people not being aware of that not being deliberately not aware being willfully blind to that when it's right there on the internet if you want it it wasn't hard to find your stuff you know i get on my phone it's free of charge i you know listen to 10 hours of content like that um what would you say to sort of young people that's experiencing that frustration as as things burn Uh, I would counsel a couple of things. Being right is not the delivery system you might imagine. There's the first thing. Being right is not comforting. Doesn't get you to the top of the heap. Knowing who the bad guys are doesn't help. It doesn't make things doable or make doable even. So that's one part of it. Another part is... Um, uh, the notion that it's easy to be aware is a challengeable notion. If it were easy to be aware, I submit to you, there'd be a lot more awareness that we'd be talking about and, and acknowledging now than we're able to in this conversation. So there's something about it in and of itself, particularly in a troubled time, the reward system is av for aversion, not for alertness. You know, I've, I've got a show called The Nights of Grief and Mystery that we tour uh, in the midst of touring all over the world now. Uh, Western, excuse me, Atlantic Canada and then uh, Scandinavia in the next 10 days or so. Okay. And um, in that circumstance, there's a line. Oh, my God, I've just forgotten it because I was distracted. Just a second. Uh, well, it's gone. It'll, I know it'll come back uh, momentarily. 
the, but the thrust of the thrust of the idea was that um, <clears throat> it's painful to see, and we have to credit that not as a moral, culp a morally culpable stance, but as something closer to bordering on the involuntary. And it would be remarkable if we could do something about the reward system that credits awareness instead of visits the aware with a degree of kind of uh, irreducible uh, brokenness on the matter. Because that is that is what happens. You know, with the this this monstrosity called the internet, and all of the information that's available as a consequence, loosely called information. You know, it, I suspect it's never been like this, that you're obliged at any given moment to contend with things that are allegedly knowable, but not actionable. Yes. See, what, 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 what's, what's to become of you if simply knowing things constitutes a moral responsibility to do something about them? I mean, you have to choose. Either you're in over your head every day, just at the level of brute information, or you decide information in and of itself is one of your primary afflictions, not your enablements, your afflictions. And you proceed differently with respect to the so-called information stream. I, I'm probably inclined to think in terms of the second one. I don't think it makes you willfully ignorant. I think what it does is gives you a chance to act on things that are relatively speaking at hand. Yes, of course, you can still bear in mind the larger story, but the larger story is not available to you via this information. The collapse of your, your sort of your, your give a shit is ongoing with the, with the mountain of got to's that, that come at you every given day. Yes, it's huge and undigestible. So I was walking through the small shopping center on the way to this interview, actually. And I was struck by something I've been struck by a lot in the last year, I think particularly since I was in Ukraine last year. And that's, I, I see a lot of people who are my age or older, but there's something young about them and not in a good way. You're not like youthful, vibrant, like something. The, ne the nearest word that comes up is something like uninitiated. I'd love to hear your thoughts on initiation and the relationship with that with death. Yeah. Well, you've just lost some listenership by that, uh, <laughs> by registering that story, there's no doubt. Um, it's, I, I recognize, I think what you're talking about. Let me, let me reflect upon it from, in a sense, the other side. I can be walking in a self same shopping center there can be a couple ahead of me. I can't tell by their gait, their clothes, or their physical relationship with the child between them, whether they are the child's parents or the child's grandparents. Because people are having children so old deep into their lives now yes. that you're that you could you could easily commit a remarkable faux pas and, and you know acknowledge somebody's grandchild who happens to be their child yes okay so these things are related what you said and what i just said I, i'm quite sure this notion first of all that reproductivity is a right whereas the the te the not the not the technology the reproductivity is your right which is only aided and abetted by the technology because the physiology is saying otherwise Clearly, the physiology is saying otherwise, which is why there is such an industry. See, so, so it's again, it's an absolute unwillingness to abide by the limits that are entrusted to you, as if it's a kind of moral hardship not to be able to physically reproduce. And it constitutes some transgression upon your sovereignty and the rest. So, by the same token, then, youth would ima imagine itself to be that life would hold it in high esteem because it hasn't screwed up badly yet because 
everything's ahead of it. You know, nobody ever says you got your whole death ahead of you. Yeah, potential again. Yeah, it's potential. It's the spell of potential. So uh, it's a haunt. And what children deserve, what young people deserve, is the end of their youth. They, they really deserve it. But youth, generally speaking, doesn't give way voluntarily. Yes. Like any living thing, your youth goes kicking and screaming. And literally in a lot of tribal cultures, right? Like that's kind of, yeah. boys are abducted from the mother and she's kind of screaming. Maybe it's kind of an act, maybe it's real. The boy is crying and there's a, there's yeah. almost an abduction out of childhood. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you somehow have to wait in the gen generic West. You have to wait for some kind of idea that all your middle ages is, is a superannuated youth. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. You. You have no reason to expect a diminishment of any kind. You get you get everything youth granted you, all the the upside, plus you get a little more understanding and a peak income generating years. My God, what a deal, you know. And so when when does the rest of the story kick in? And the answer is preferably never. But if it does at all, you're back to the aging thing again. And sort of who wants to get old? Mm. The mm. kids deserve. It seems to me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to lose a few viewers here now with this one. Kids deserve less than we had when we were their age. I don't mean that in any punitive sense of the term. I mean that the culture that was alive when I was a very young person rewarded the idea that parents were had an obligation to generate more stuff on behalf of and for their kids. That was a basically a depression era mentality, an immigrant mentality that never was seriously questioned, right? And you mentioned it almost off the top, that kids are, quote, poorer, would be interesting ways of measuring that, but just, uh, just as, an, as a sort of cultural disturbance, that kids are poorer, first generation to be poorer than their parents. I would suggest the, pos the, the following possibility, that the culture in every sense of the term would be better off if we could come around to the understanding that the kids deserved less than we of what we had when we were their age because the demonstrable excuse me consequence for us delivering on that right is staring us in the face now yeah growth can't go on forever and um that's impossible yeah tough tough message for a young person who can't afford a house uh, in the UK, you know, that's a sort of uh, the British dream, simple things. And it's not like the rest of the, the, you know, there's still this big consumerism in the economy. It's just the wealth being loaded in smaller and smaller kind of number of hands. Okay, so how about, how about this? Absolutely, I hear what you're saying. How about this? Okay, on whose watch is it supposed to change then? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, if we're talking about it can't go on like this, and if young people are in on the understanding that it can't go on like this, where would they like the, this massive alteration to occur? After their time? To their children? Or their grandchildren? Or when's the most optimal time yeah. for this kind of correction? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's and the immaturity of the boomer generation is just selling the future. You know, like, yeah. this will happen later, not, 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 not with us. Yeah. It seems like I'm um, sort of bitter truths or uncomfortable truths. Tough love seems to be kind of one of your things. You know, I've heard you say a couple of times you may lose from listeners and I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, our job's to serve the listeners, not to please them. W what are some of your sort of least popular messages that kind of people walk out of your talks when you say, like some of the ones where you go, oh, even I pause a little bit to say this. Man, that's a good question. Uh... Well, I could tell you a story. I don't know if this is a, sort of a class action scenario or just this particular situation. But so I was asked to teach something that the organizers called grief and climate change. This is a long time ago before anybody put those two words together. And I did it out in the West Coast. <clears throat> and about 15 or 20 minutes in, this couple got up and very noisily exited the facility. 
and they were noisy enough to to engage in a kind of almost comical stage whisper between each other on the way out. Where they made sure everybody could hear them. And this is what they said one to the other. Huh, I thought this was supposed to be about climate change. Slam went the door. And that was it. That's what the rest of us were left with. So clearly they were, I don't think they were disappointed because they weren't getting enough climate change information from me. You'd, I mean, it's ludicrous to think that you would get it, but that's what not the operative dilemma. The operative dilemma was they figured they already had the grief thing nailed down, you see. And I can tell you from a lot of um, foreheads up against the wall that grief is, we're grief illiterate man, okay? So when somebody starts talking grief, you literally can't understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. That of all of them, that might be the one that curries the least favor. Mm. That, that grief is a mandatory presence on the scene now and not an intrusion into the natural order of things. Mm. Another big topic. What's going on with gender? I've heard you're good on fathers, masculinity, marriage. I think you're writing a book about. What's going on with gender? Like the, the last few years, seems like something has happened and I can't make sense of it. Well, it's not something I spend a lot of time on. And it's that establishes me as uh, out of touch in some fashion. I agree. <clears throat> but uh, out of mall, I would say, rather than out of touch. That's I, I'd better characterize myself that way. I've chosen... But, you know, to not avoid the thing entirely. What you're talking about here that is mistakenly uh, apportioned to things gender is actually the notion of identity. So there's something about identity that is at the same time so infirm, so imperceptibly um, mercurial now on the one side and lamentably so on the other side. The, the mobilization around identity is the, the Shakespearean adage, you know, it's just too much protest. It's, it's suggesting something else. It's the claims that are staked upon in the territory of identity suggest to me a kind of unwelcome volatility that very few people seem to be able to manage. And so they actually imagine they can choose who they are. There, in a nutshell, is it's not nonsensical. It's, it's untraceable as a notion. You can trace its constituent parts, but I don't think you can trace its... its uh, there's not a, a fount of legitimacy to the understanding that you get to choose who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I hear this, I hear this virtually daily. So I think this may be your most unpopular statement, so let's underline it. <laughs> you don't get to choose who you are. Right. You okay. don't get to choose who you let, are. No, indeed. Let me give you an example of what this looks like in the real world, baby. Okay? Here's the real world situation. Now you're dead. Okay? And if you're lucky or if you're Irish or Italian, somebody's going to have some kind of event that nominally is called a wake. Right? Okay. What happens at a wake? The answer is people start assembling the meaning of your life. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. And they may do so deliberately or otherwise. They may do so in a kind fashion or otherwise. They may make shit up as they go. They may have it right or some combination thereof. Well, the point is that the meaning of your life can't be accumulated and ordered until you have nothing further to say, because you just mess up the circuitry by your participation. So when you're done, the rest of us have the responsibility to assign your life its meaning, not, not its approval, its meaning, its consequence, its, uh, its lived outedness, you see. And if you're there, you short circuit that thing. And that's why the, a lot of baby boomers are just laughably insisting on being at their celebration of lives 
while they still can like they like they they deserve that too it's just it's just <laughs> remarkable man without remarkable realizing yeah. yeah without realizing that their presence on the scene renders the rest of us incapable of doing our work when it comes to their particular life's meaning purpose yeah. and consequence right so that's what i mean i'm not i'm not saying that you don't participate i'm just saying you're not really the judge, jury, and executioner of the meaning of your life. You you participate in it. You contribute to it, and you'd have it otherwise. But the beautiful, I mean, if you've ever been documented, the subject of a documentary film, which I was, you know, you come out the experience going, who the hell's that guy? Right, and because right, right. Because that's not your take on you. Well, that doesn't mean that you've got the market cornered on you. It's not what it means. It just means you don't recognize yourself coming out of the mouths of other people. Yes. So it, it invites you to adjust your understanding of yourself instead of, you know, double down on who you think you are. Yeah. I remember having the same feeling at my wedding going, oh, this isn't for me or my wife. Indeed. So this Hence is the, the book about matrimony to come. Exactly right. It's not for you. Yeah. A lot of people go through divorces. You know, I've got some stuff I won't say on the podcast, but some personal kind of interest here. It seems like that's a huge grief for a lot of people. You know, over 50% of marriages end that way. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that, that death. Yeah, well, certainly uh, your divorce is for you. So we could say that. But the other thing I'd mention is um, <laughs> if you devolve your understanding of the commons or the collective to a village mindedness and then devolve further from village mindedness to the primacy of the nuclear family and devolve again to the sanctity and inviolability of the God-given individual and subdivide that again into identity politics and your personal psyche. Be not surprised that every effort you make to, to make a serious go of it as an engaged human being is ongoingly compromised because the cultural sustenance is not available to you, right? Because there, there basically is no village. There's no village mind to rely upon, to be, to be, to wed yourself to and to be second best too. So suddenly you have to be all you can be. Suddenly you have to carry the whole thing. Suddenly you have to provide what the village in its absence does not provide to somebody else. And you can't do it. You can't make up for what's missing at that level of cultural uh, degradation that I just described. So, and I, and I don't think it's over, sadly. I mean, the, the notion of, this diabolical reduction of the, the prime integer of what constitutes a legitimate life has come down to how you feel about yourself. There is no collective responsibility that comes with uh, the slavish fawning after identity, it seems to me. Or it's an early casualty, at least. Mm. All right. Last question. Um, yeah. I support a team of young psychologists in Ukraine uh, called the Sane Ukraine team. They're mostly sort of smart young women, very proud of them. And they've sort of suddenly gone from young women at university to daily giving lectures to people who have been around a lot of death, soldiers, for example. They'll do talks to 200 soldiers, you know, just outside the front lines. Um, anything you'd pass on to those young women? Oh, God. Well, I don't think they're seeing death. For the most part, I think what they're seeing is casualty, the calculations of murder. That's what, that's what the transactions of warfare are. They're not death. <clears throat> it's simply not the same thing as what we were talking about off the top. It's not the same event because someone's heart stopped beating. It doesn't mean the same thing. 
It's not a consequence of the same thing. It's not a given. Warfare is not a given, for example. So, <clears throat> so I wouldn't generalize personally from anything I've seen or done to a frontline piece of mayhem. But, <clears throat> but maybe I could pass on something that was passed on to me in Israel very recently, who the Israelis, of course, the conscious ones are really going through it again now. And um, the guy who brought me over was driving me from one event to the next. And apropos of nothing in particular, he said, he looked out the windscreen and he said, you know, we're still not here, he said. And there was a long pause and he said, uh, no, that's why we treat the Palestinians the way we do, because we're still not here. We're in the camps. We're still in the camps, he said. That's an Israeli talking, and a conscious and deliberate man in a position of real responsibility and leadership, I have to say. And the bravery of fessing up to that in a circumstance like what they're living out right now is quite remarkable. The reason I mention it in connection with your Ukraine scenario is this. As hard as this is, the peace in whatever form, whatever mangled form it's likely to take, will be by several order items of order worse than any of the uh, casualties and the uh, armed conflict is as it currently exists. Yes. The, you know, who are the Russians to us, given all of the intermarriage and all of the interplay between them over the centuries? Uh, you know, how they're going to work that out, um, how they're going to live with a sense of gross injustice and and the, the the utter vacancy of justice in the time to come, which is almost certainly part of the deal. Because, uh, you know, everybody learned from the First World War in Versailles, right? The Marshall Plan and so on. The whole thing was, you can't use the peace to punish the loser. If you do, you're planting more seeds for a couple generations from now. Mm -hmm. So God knows how they live out the peace, the mangled peace that's going to be available to them. But that's where the real work, that's where the real psychology, that's where the real village mindedness has got to come to, you know, to, to bear upon the circumstances that are being lived out now. Yeah, I've been um, discussing with the team about the reintegration of soldiers. And they said, well, it's a bit early for that, isn't it? I said, oh, no, this, this is going to be the real son of a bitch. This, yeah. this, like, unless you want alcoholism and domestic violence for the next, you know, two or three generations. So, um, yeah, good to get ahead of that one. Stephen, deep, powerful, poetic as ever, sir. I've uh, enjoyed your your uh, your offering here. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a, a a cat scan in a, in a couple of weeks to see if I have a brain tumor because I've got my eyes are going wrong. So I'll definitely be reading your stuff between now and then, as a, just as a uh, <laughs> precaution. And uh, orphan wisdom. It's a great name. That's where people go, right? Orphanwisdom.com to right. see all your yeah. books and all your stuff. Yeah. And to see us bring a, a Knights of Grief and Mystery traveling roadshow, medicine roadshow to a town near you. You can get all that information uh, for the balance of the year. We're on the road more than we're at home. So there's that too, which I, I have to say, I would deeply recommend, but I don't want to skip over what you said about, about the CAT scan. You know, um, we can be jocular, and there's nothing wrong with being jocular on the matter. But this shit is scary, too. And uh, when you say it, you know, I'm back in those days as much as I'm in my days now. And I'm not facing a CAT scan anytime soon that I'm aware of. But when you are, you count your days differently, or you should. So, for you know, at the risk of offering a suggestion to you that you haven't asked for, let the thing still you. Being still is not the same thing as being vulnerable. Let the thing leach out from you most of your sense of authority and certainty and things of that ilk. And um, let, it, let it do something to you that seems counterintuitive. And, uh, you know, God willing, the information that you glean from the thing is benign in every sense of that term. But regardless of whether it is or whether it isn't, what you do between now and getting the results 
determines to a great degree how you see yourself coming on. So let it steal you, man. It's a powerful piece of business when you don't know if you're okay or not. Stephen, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for this.